Good morning, everyone. We'll uh, continue our discussion today on uh, shrinkage. We were talking about different means of measuring shrinkage uh, in the last class. And we saw that uh, the primary measure of shrinkage should be in the restrained condition because that's what generates cracking. And if you have to really uh, st study the influence of fibers, uh, there's no point in studying the free shrinkage because that may not be too different as compared to regular non-fiber reinforced concrete. So for really understanding the impact of fibers better, it's always better to do a restrained shrinkage experiment, which is done with the help of the restrained ring test, right? You have a concrete ring which is restrained by a steel ring from shrinking. And when this restraint leads to a stress that is exceeding the tensile stress of the concrete, there's cracking in the concrete. And this cracking obviously is the time of occurrence, uh, occurrence of the cracking as well as the width of the crack are both altered significantly whenever the concrete is reinforced with fibers. Nevertheless, most shrinkage studies in uh, uh, concrete mix design as well as research studies with concrete are done using the free shrinkage measurements, where you simply pr prepare prismatic specimens of the concrete and subject it to a drying environment and measure the length periodically. Okay? So essentially, this is free volumetric contraction without any restraint. That's what you mean by free drying shrinkage. So again, this is useful to correlate the amount of restrained tensile strain that has actually occurred in the concrete. And usually it is done with the help of uh, a methodology that is prescribed in ASTM C157. Of course, this is a standard methodology. Most codes have a similar methodology. It's not much uh, complicated. You have, you need to prepare prismatic specimens. You need to store them in uh, regular moisturing conditions until the age at which you want to start the exposure to drying. There is no predetermined age. You can decided based upon your site conditions. For example, in some cases you can cure for 7 days, in other cases you may cure for 28 days. Yeah? And then beyond that you expose it to the drying environment, typically at 50 percent relative humidity. That is what a typical drying environment is. Okay? And then you monitor the length change periodically. I am just going to show you some experimental results on free drying shrinkage on 3 different sets of binders. Remember we had talked about limestone, calcium and clay cement and this is being compared against OPC and a mix which has 30 percent fly ash as a replacement of OPC. And these are the mixed designs on the right. You have an M30 concrete, an M50 concrete and a common mix which has the same binder content and water binder ratio for all three mixes. So these concretes are specially designed concretes where the water cement ratio and the binder content may differ for the different types of binders that have been used because ultimately the design is based on achievement of the strength at 28 days. Okay. So, some of the results that you are likely to see as far as these concretes are concerned may also be attributed to the fact that these mixes have different binder contents and water binder ratios. So, obviously the paste content in these mixes can be different because of the uh, difference in binder content and water binder ratio. Whereas this common mix, all the pastes will be of the same volume or sorry, not volume, the same mass. Why, why not the same volume? Because the Concretes which have LC3 or FA30 binders will have slightly higher paste volume as opposed to OPC because of the lighter specific uh, lighter density of the FA, uh, fly ash as well as the LC3 components. Okay, so let's look at the evolution of shrinkage. So here the shrinkage is actually measured on cylindrical specimens, again by pasting pellets on the surface of the cylindrical specimens and measuring the deformation between the pellets using what is called a Demek gauge, right? Just like what we did for the creep experiment that we did previously. Now, what you need to understand is if you have a specimen that is under load and is also subjected to drying at the same time, the deformation is not just because of creep, it is also because of shrinkage. So, whenever you do a creep experiment, you are supposed to also carry out a shrinkage experiment of the same type of specimens, that is the cylindrical specimens of 150 millimeter diameter and 300 millimeters height. Okay? So, on these specimens, you can see the differences in shrinkage here between the different binders. So, we did some sealed specimens. So, there we could measure the autogenous shrinkage and we also did some unsealed specimens where we are actually measuring the total shrinkage which is composed of autogenous plus the drying shrinkage. Right? So, here please note that the result is expressed in terms of increase in autogenous shrinkage. Now, why is it like that? Because we have no control about what is happening within the mould. When the concrete is within the mould, I explained earlier that there is a lot of self desiccation already going on inside the concrete. But since we are not able to measure the length when the concrete is inside the mould, we do not have a very clear answer to what the actual autogenous shrinkage is. So, what we are doing is measuring from the time that the concrete is actually exposed to the drying uh, or from the concrete that the 
uh, from the time that the concrete is taken out of the mould and sealed. From that point onwards you are measuring the length and what is expressed here is the increase in autogenous shrinkage. So when you compare the different types of binders, you see that the autogenous shrinkage increase for OPC and LC3 are nearly similar, for fly ash mix it is slightly higher. As far as total shrinkage is concerned, the LC3 mix shows a marginally higher total shrinkage. This is for an M30 grade of concrete. Again for M50, the differences are a little bit more pronounced, uh, where OPC and LC3 mixes are showing slightly higher free shrinkage as opposed to the fly ash concrete mix. So please uh, look at the time axis here, this is data up to one year or little bit more than one year. So again you see that these graphs have not entirely stabilized, you do not see a perfectly horizontal uh, sort of a system here because there is continuous drying that is actually happening in the system that means there is still drying which is continuing in this process, okay. So again the lower shrinkage that you see with fly ash 30 percent replacement mixes is primarily because of this effect that you have a lesser water content in the system because the fly ash mix had to be designed with a 0.45 water cement ratio to obtain this 30 megapascal grade whereas the OPC and LC3 mixes could be designed with higher water binder ratios, okay. That means you have lesser water available in the system in the fly ash mix, so naturally the shrinkage is lower, okay. Now in terms of uh, the common mix, the common mix, the total shrinkage that was observed was not much different from the, for the three different types of concretes. That means that irrespective of the binder type, when you have the same binder content and water binder ratio, the shrinkage is not all that different. Again, autogenous shrinkage increase is also in the same lines for all three different types of binders. Again, on this side, the shrinkage is plotted against the weight loss and you see a fairly good linear relationship between the shrinkage and weight loss. Of course, what I had earlier told you is mostly you will get a bilinear relationship. In the first part, the weight loss will be more and then you have a constant weight loss based on the shrinkage, extent of shrinkage. So in the early part, the level of shrinkage will be very small as opposed to the amount of weight loss. But I guess we are not capturing that part very well in this case, okay. So what we are actually seeing a start of the second phase almost immediately, okay. So uh, binder effects and drying shrinkage need to be worked out every time that you do a concrete mix design because when you change the binder, you are affecting different characteristics of the concrete. First of all, you are changing the paste volume because the binder that you adopt instead of OPC may have a slightly different specific gravity leading to a different paste volume. And you know that paste is the component that is subjected to shrinkage, not the aggregate. But paste volume is not the only effect. What happens to the characteristics of the paste? What happens to the interfacial transition zone, what happens to the overall stiffness of the concrete, all that will go into determining what happens when the concrete is subjected to drying, okay. So this has to be worked out experimentally. Uh, shrinkage models are available which can help you predict shrinkage, but then very often we find that there is a lot of discrepancy between different types of models. You must have talked about different prediction models and these prediction models are widely varying from each other and the experimental data usually matches with one or two of the models and not all of them. So again, this goes to show that whenever you are designing concrete and where shrinkage and creep are going to be a concern, it is always better to actually study these properties before you go into the actual construction process rather than just relying on an estimate of workability and strength, okay. So in many of the high rise buildings for instance, right, when you have uh, 70, 80 stories, you can imagine that the extent of creep that you can expect from concrete can be tremendous. But then we also use high strength concrete in such applications. So when you use high strength concrete, what happens? Can you st still use the same creep coefficients that are prescribed in your codes or do you need a modification for that? What about the levels of drying shrinkage? Do you get the same drying shrinkage or should you start accounting for autogenous shrinkage separately? So these are questions that need to be answered by additional testing to be done at the time of mixed design. It is not as simple as just putting up something together and getting workability and strength. So we need to have sufficient amount of time before we can actually prescribe the mix for a given situation. Now when you come to regular concretes, M20, M30 concretes which are used on a day to day application like residential buildings, your regular column and beam filling concrete and so on, there the issues of shrinkage and creep can be very well controlled by what provisions we already have in the codes. You do not probably need additional testing for that, right. But then when you are designing special applications, for example high rise buildings, dams, water retaining structures where crack width could be a very important factor, 
all those considerations need to be taken into account for designing the concrete mix appropriately. Okay? So, there is a lot of uh, recommendations of further reading. Many of these are actually RILEM reports. RILEM is an international organization which is similar to your American Concrete Institute or Indian Concrete Institute. Here, there is a lot of research reports that have been published by several technical committees that have worked within RILEM. And these reports are available for free on the RILEM website. So, I suggest those of you who are interested in further understanding the subject to go and take a look at these uh, reports that have been published on the website. Uh, some of these may, may not be directly downloadable. You may have to write to the organization to actually get permission to uh, access these documents, but they are free. They are freely available. 